finished up last week in 1 Peter. Today we're going to jump right into the book of John. We're not going to go into 2 Peter, but we're going to jump right into the book of John. I believe that every couple of years that it is good and beneficial to go through one of the four Gospels. And the reason I feel this is because it keeps Jesus, the person of Jesus, fresh in our minds of who He is and what He's done for each one of us. Now, what's kind of interesting is because the way that you look at Jesus will determine the way that you live your life. And you'll see, as I go through this morning, we should be out here by 2 o'clock, so go ahead and set your watch. No, I'm just joking <laughs> for the new people. But the way that you and I look at Jesus will determine how you and I will live our lives. Do you agree with that? So what we're going to see is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics. And that basically means that they're, they're together. They kind of see things in a similar way. Even though each one of the four Gospels they present who Jesus is, but they present it in a slightly different way. And the reason why is because each one of those uh, authors there, each one is talking to a different audience. Now, how many of you know that if you're a plumber and you go out to a job site and you're speaking to other plumbers, you don't use electrical language or you don't use concrete language. You use the language that you're used to using every day. If we're talking about baseball to a group of baseball people, we don't start using basketball terms, do we? We use the language that whoever we're speaking to that they're familiar with. As an example, Matthew, Matthew was writing unto the Jewish people. And so what Matthew was explaining to the Jewish people, that Jesus Christ, he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, when you get into Mark, Mark was speaking to the Roman Christians, and as Mark was speaking to him, he was talking about how Jesus is the servant. So one, saying that he's the fulfillment of the prophecy. As you get into Mark, Mark saying that Jesus is the servant. As you get into Luke, Luke was writing to the Greek audience. Luke was saying that Jesus was the perfect man. Now, whenever you get over into John, which we're going to start today, John's going to talk about how Jesus is the way for eternal life. Can you see how each writer looked at Jesus in a little bit different view because of the audience that he was speaking to? So that's very, very important that John is talking to us, and John's going to talk about how Jesus is the way of eternal life. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. As I said, the way that you and I look at Jesus will determine how you and I live our lives every single day. Now, just to give you a little bit of a briefing about John, I could be here for a week talking about John, but I'm not going to. But I'm going to hit just a couple of points, just to kind of refresh your memory a little bit. John was the brother of James. They were called the sons of Zebedee. They were among the first disciples to be called by Jesus. So John was with Jesus the full three years of his ministry. Okay, John, James, and Peter, they were known as the inner circle. They were known as to be the closest to Jesus. In other words, they got the witness things that the other disciples did not get the witness. Also, the Apostle Paul, he refers to John as one of the pillars of the church. You can see where I'm going with this. John had been with Jesus throughout Jesus' entire ministry and John got to witness a lot of things. He spent time with Jesus every single day. As a matter of fact, the John that wrote the book of John is the same John that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's also the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. Okay? What's kind of funny is John never referred to himself as John. What did he refer to himself as? The one whom Jesus loved. Anytime John wanted to say something about himself, he'd say, oh, you know, the one whom Jesus loved. And that's the way he referred to himself. So, and here's something else. The Gospel of John goes further back in time than any of the other Gospels. It doesn't mean that it was the first one written, but it goes further back in time. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they focus a lot on the genealogy of Jesus. 
Whereas John's going to go back all the way to the beginning of creation and talk about Jesus was being there at that present time. So John's gospel, even though he goes further back in the time, it was one of the last of the four gospels that were to be written. And it was written somewhere between A.D., 80, and 100, somewhere in that era. We don't know the exact time. Now, here's the thing. What was happening at that time, and what caused John to write this, this gospel? One of the theories is, is because there was a group of people that had filtered into the local church that were known as Gnostics. And they were teaching Gnosticism. What that basically means is knowledge. They were coming to the church and they were teaching that salvation come by what you knew. In other words, not by who you knew, but by what you knew. And believe it or not, there's still a lot of people today, and what you're going to see as I go through this morning... To wrap it up this morning, I'm going to bring in some different religions of today, of 2014, so that we can relate to what they believe compared to what the Bible teaches. Because what other people say doesn't necessarily make it the gospel, does it? And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. So here are these Gnostics. They They were maintaining that here's what they were saying, that the body was evil, but only the spirit was good about a person. The body was evil, But the spirit was good. But the spirit was asleep in the soul and it needed to be woken up. And it needed to be waken up and liberated by knowledge. By what you knew. And that's why they were teaching that salvation came by knowledge within the spirit and not by faith in Christ. Isn't it amazing? All the way back to the early church days, there was false teaching back in that particular time. Just like there's false teaching today. Now, they were also saying that, that they believed that Christ was a spirit, since only the spirit is good, that, J, that Jesus may be a God, but he was one of many gods. He was not God himself. He was a God, with a little g, but not God with the big g himself. And they were teaching this. And they said that since Jesus did good, though, he was only a spirit and he was not a flesh man. So can you see where they're going? All this that they were teaching was strictly head knowledge, but it had nothing to do with heart. And you've always heard that expression, or maybe you have, there's 18 inches between heaven and hell. And that 18 inches is usually between what you have up here and what you have down here. You may have it in your head, but do you have it in your heart? And they were teaching that you had to have it up here. Now, John's going to start his gospel right out here, and he's going to refute that thought that it's all by knowledge. Jump right in to John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those of you that write in your Bibles, which is okay, it's your own Bible, you can write in it. Underline right there, in the beginning was the Word. Then I want you to underline in that same sentence there, with God. And then also underline, was God. Then in verse 2 it says, he was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. So here we see that in the beginning, when does that refer to? That refers all the way back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. We just got through, or we started studying the book of Genesis. Right at the very beginning, God was there. God had always been there. We don't really know when that that beginning was, do we? All that we know is that when we started recording it, God was already there. God created it. God created the heavens and the earth. John was essentially saying that when the beginning began... Listen to this. When the beginning began, the Word was already there. The Word was already there. That is, the Word predates any time or creation. The Word was there before the world was created, before any time that we start tracking time, the Word was already there. In other words, the Word was there before anything was. Does that make sense or does that sound confusing? Before you can go back and track what happened at the beginning, God was already there. 
the Word was already there. The Word, who does the Word represent? The Word represents Jesus. And I'm going to explain to you real briefly about how did they come up with the Word referring to Jesus. Because the idea of the term Word in the Hebrew is devar, which was understood by both the Jews and the Gentiles. To the Jews, that phrase, the Word, now this is important that you understand this, that phrase, the Word, is seen as something more than a sound. It's more than what you hear coming out of my mouth. In the Old Testament reference, the Word of God was seen as the creative power of God, wasn't it? Because when you go back to the book of Genesis, like in Genesis 1-3 or 6-11, or God said, let there be light and life. God spoke everything into existence. When the prophets conveyed God's message in the Old Testament, they usually start out by saying, And thus saith the Lord. So that word, the word, has the power that created things. It has the word to make things happen. It possessed the power to do something. Now keep in mind, this was to the Jews. Now when you look at the other side, which was the Gentile, and by the way, Gentile just means non-Jew. Most of us in this room, since we're not of the Jewish faith, we would be considered a Gentile, a non-Jew. Now, the Gentiles, they looked at this phrase, the word, in a physiological way, just through the mental type way. They knew that when they looked at the word, and by the way, are you familiar with the word logos? Logos. Yes. That is the phrase that's very, very popular. So that for the Greeks, the term referred to Behind the scenes. What was going on behind the scenes? What was in mind? There's a reason and there's a power that kept everything in order. In other words, there was a word that kept things from going in chaos. It kept things in place, in order. They believed that it was the word. So as you can see, the Jews had an idea of the word and the Gentiles had an idea of the word. So now John's going to jump right in and say, hey, let me tell you what that word is and who it is. So John's going to use this common idea of the Jews and the Gentiles to proclaim that Jesus was the word. Jesus was the word. That Jesus was the visible expression of God, of who God is and what God is like. Jesus was God's way of talking to man. People say, how do you know what God's like? How do you know what God has to say? And I tell people, if you want to know what God is like, read the life of Jesus. When you want to know what God thinks about a situation, look and see what Jesus has to be, say about that situation. And you'll know what God has to say about it. Amen? So in John 14, 9, Jesus says... He that has seen me has seen the Father. That's pretty bold. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus, the person. Now, in verses 1 and 2, I want us to notice three things I told you if you underline. There's three statements made about Christ, the Word. Christ is the Word. There's three statements that was made about Him. Number one, Christ was pre-existent. In the beginning. In the beginning. Christ was already there in the beginning. He was already there. John 1, 2, he sa it says there, John 1, 2 says that he was in the beginning, not from the beginning, but he was already there. That's important that we understand. He was there in the beginning. In other words, he was without a beginning. Jesus was without a beginning. We have to clearly understand that. He was not created. He was already there. He was in the beginning from all eternity. He has always existed. So number one, he was pre-existent. Number two, he was co-existent. Because look what it says right through there. It says, with God. Christ was with God in the beginning. Jesus is a distinct person from God. This is hard sometimes for us to put our minds around. How can it be, how can God be Jesus in the flesh. Well, number one, that's where faith comes in. 
The scripture is very, very clear that tells us this. You and I have to have the faith to believe it. And by the way, anything that you and I say or believe, it has to come from the Word of God. If I make a statement at any time or other, I want you to, and it doesn't sound right, be a Berean. Go to the scriptures and see what I have to say if it lines up with the scripture. If it doesn't, come to me and let's sit down and reason. or Not fight, but reason over why I say something. Don't correct me up here in front of everybody. That can get out of order. But there is correct order to do certain things. So, number one, he is with God. He was a, a pre-existent. Number two, he is co-existent. He is with God in the beginning. Jesus was a distinct person from God the Father. Now, number three, Christ, the Word, was God. He not only dwelt with God, but he himself was God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's very important for us to understand those three phases of Jesus. Now, if now you want to fast forward things. <laughs> okay, Jesus was there in the beginning. How many years went by before Jesus actually came to earth? We don't know. Could have been millions, trillions, zillions. I don't know how many years it was since when the earth was first created up to when he actually came to earth. But if you look in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says right there, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelled among us. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then 14, then the Word became flesh. God looked at earth, seeing that we were in a predicament, mankind, and God wanted to take care of that situation by God coming to earth in the form of the person, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? God come to earth in the flesh, it says that he dwelt here. That word dwelt, tabernacle. In other words, Jesus dwelt here on earth in the tabernacle, the tent, his body, for 33 years or so. So now we see he became flesh. He was born in a manger. He dwelt among men. Uh, his body was the tent, which he lived in for 33 years. Now, here's where I'm going with this. So far, at this morning, we have seen that Jesus was already there in the beginning of creation. Jesus was with God. That Jesus is a distinct person. Jesus is God in the flesh. And God come to earth as the person of Jesus Christ. Are we on the same page so far? We all see similar, through similar lens right now. Now, how do modern day religions... Look at this viewpoint that I'm teaching you this morning. How do they accept what you and I are talking about believing this morning? Do you and I have the right to judge other people by what they believe? Some people say yes, some people no. We talked about in First, P or, yes, First Peter about two or three weeks ago as a shepherd of the flock. As a pastor of a church, shepherd of the flock, his main responsibility is to pray for the church, teach them the word, feed the flock, teach the word of God, which is what I believe that we're doing. When you and I study the word, that is feeding you the word of God. But also another responsibility of the shepherd is to protect his flock. And that means protecting you from things that are going on that could cause you to stumble in your faith with God. Does that make sense? Okay. Over in Romans, you don't have to flip it, but if you want to write it down, you're welcome to. In Romans chapter 16, and in verse 17, people say, what gives you the right to judge somebody else's? The Word of God tells me to. It says in Romans 16, it says, Now I urge you, brethren, Note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine to which you have learned. What does it say to do? Avoid them. Avoid them. Then in verse 18 it says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. So I believe when I read the Scriptures that it gives me the right to tell you what to listen to and what not to listen to. Because my main responsibility is protecting you. That doesn't necessarily mean physically. It means spiritually. Okay, think about this. What are we to watch out for and what are we to keep away from? And I'm going to name a couple of groups. And I may offend some of you. I'm not here to preach and tell you who to hang out with and who not. But I am here to tell you what they believe and, what, and how they believe compared to what we believe as evangelical Christians. Okay? Number one, the Jehovah Witnesses. We just got through studying about who Jesus was, okay? In the beginning was the Word, words was with God, the Word was God, then the Word became flesh. What does the Jehovah Witnesses believe about Jesus Christ? Jesus is a God, a God, but not fully God. So by referring to Him as a God, it's taken away from His deity. The second thing that they believe is before he lived on earth as a person, he was Michael the archangel. The other thing, on earth, he lived a perfect life. After dying on a stake, not a cross, but on a stake, he was resurrected as a spirit, but his body was destroyed. Jesus is not coming again. He's already returned invisibly. In 1914, in spirit. You can go directly to their website, any of these people I'm talking about, and it gives all this, because that's where I go, right to the website, see what they believe. Very soon, he and the angels, talking about Jesus, will destroy all non-Jehovah witnesses. They believe that there's going to be 144,000 that live with God in heaven. If you're not part of that 144,000, you won't live with him in heaven. That is the Jehovah Witnesses. Now, can you see the way they believe compared to the way the Christian faith believes? We believe that he is God himself with the big G. He's not a God, but God. The second group I want to talk about is the Mormons. The Latter-day Saints. They believe that Jesus is a separate God from the Father, Elohim. He's a separate God. If you read the scriptures like I lead, Elohim was God. But they believe that he is separate. He was created as a spirit child by the Father and the Mother in heaven. They're talking about Jesus now. Keep that in mind. Jesus, <laughs> this is what gets me, is how we have, and what made me even start talking about this this morning when I went home about a year or two ago to be with my family, we were at lunch one day, and there's a brother there to, I call him a brother, uh, he's a very dear friend of my uncle. He's a Jehovah Witness. They asked him to pray over the meal. I don't want him praying over my meal, because he ain't praying to the same God that I serve. And when we got together, I didn't start anything in public in, in front of anybody. But when we got back later and we were all sitting around talking, he wasn't there. I asked my family, how do you feel about him? I know he's a wonderful guy. You love him to death. He is a wonderful guy. But he doesn't believe in the same Jesus that I believe in. So when he's praying, he's not praying to the same God that you believe in. You see where I'm going with this? Jesus is different to many, many different religions out there. You need to know who you believe in because what you believe in will determine the way you live your life. Also, the Mormons there, they believe that Jesus is the elderly brother, get this, he's the elderly brother of all men and spirit beings, including Lucifer. They believe that Jesus and Lucifer, Satan, the devil, were brothers. They believed that God and Mary had a relationship, and that's how Jesus and the devil were created. 
by God and Mary having a relationship. All this stuff sounds far out, doesn't it? When you look at all the intellectual people that we see that are running for president, running for all these offices, and they're so intelligent, you stop and you think, how can you go there and how can you believe all this? But they do, folks. They believe that. That his body was created through a sexual union between Elohim and Mary. They believe that Jesus was married. I don't know about you, but my Bible does not say anything about Jesus ever being married. Their thing is, his death on the cross does not provide full atonement for all sin. There's no eternal life, listen to this, there's no eternal life without Mormon membership. If you're not a member of the Mormon faith, you will not go to heaven. So we've seen the Jehovah Witness. Who do they believe about Jesus? What do they believe about it? We've seen the Mormons. Next is this New Age. It's become a very, very popular. You can go around, there's a lot of Mary Baker reading rooms and a lot of different things where they've got the New Age, spiritualism, and you sit in there and they're becoming. They've got a reading room in just about every major town around. There's one in Asheville. And there's one in most of your major cities where people could just go in and read. Here's what they believe the New Age. They believe that Jesus is not the one true God. He is not a, a Savior, but He is a spiritual model and a guru. They believe that Jesus did not rise physically from the dead, but He rose into a higher spiritual realm. Next, Scientology. A lot of you know a couple of movie stars are in it, and they're the ones that really uh, brought Scientologists out into the open. Uh, I'm from Clearwater, Florida. Right where I'm from is the National Scientologist. The World Global Scientologist headquarters is right down the street from my house. You go down there, and you walk anywhere in downtown Clearwater, and all you see is a bunch of soldiers walking around. And I call them soldiers because they all wear blue pants, white shirts, or, or vice versa. They all look like a military group. And you can walk down the street, and you can walk face-to-face -to -face with them, and you can say hello, and they won't acknowledge you because they're taught not to mix with the people of the world. Now, what do these Scientologists believe? <laughs> Jesus is rarely ever mentioned in Scientology. Jesus is not the creator, and Jesus did not die for sin. Now, with each one of these groups, I could go on and on and on and list all types of things about them. But I just want you to know, what do these different groups, who do they believe that Jesus is? The Islams. They're the Muslims who adhere to the Islamic faith. Listen to this. Jesus was not God or the Son of God. He was a sinless, he was sinless, he was a worker of miracles, and one of the most respected prophets sent by Allah. He was not crucified or resurrected. And Jesus, listen to this, Jesus, not Mohammed, will return to play a special role before the future judgment day, perhaps turning Christians to Islam. Is that pretty wild or what? Can you see how these different religions, their viewpoint of Jesus? And the Christians, our faith, according to the Christian faith, Jesus is God in the flesh. John 14, 9 says, whoever has seen me, he has seen the Father. He also says in Colossians 1, 15, that he is the image of the invisible God. So as you can see, not all religions believe the same about the person of Jesus, can you? So when you're, and I'm not saying that you go out and you be bitter towards these people, you love on them. <laughs> and hopefully that will open the door for you to be able to share your faith and what you believe. But you have to be careful not become part of it. Because I have people every day tell me, well not every day, but a couple times a week, I have somebody tell me, oh I've been doing a Bible study, and I'll say, great. Who are, you, who are you doing it with? Well, there's two or three guys that come by my house every week. And we sit and we study the scriptures together. Well, you know who that is. It's coming by their house. Now, here's the thing. As I said earlier, that who you believe Jesus is will determine the way you live. Can you see where I'm going with that? If you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, 
And that he is the only way to heaven because the Bible says no other name under heaven can be called upon except the name of Jesus for eternal life. Can you see that? But yet when you listen to these other religions, they don't even teach that Jesus is the way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? By me. Now, these other groups, they don't even believe that Jesus is the way. So this morning, I just want us to start out this morning in the book of John just by us really, really, really grabbing a hold of who Jesus is. Is God in the flesh. He is the one that you believe in for eternal life. No other name. Not Jehovah. Witness. Not the Mormon faith. But Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Can you see where we're going with this? It's so important to know who you believe. Now here's a question I want to leave you with. If somebody walked up to you today and said, why do you believe? Could you give them a clear reason why you believe in Jesus Christ? Jesus says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you. Could you give somebody an intelligent reason of why you believe in Jesus Christ? And I pray that that you can do that. If you can't do that, learn your testimony. <laughs> when nothing, You know what? There's a lot of people that you and I cannot sit down with and we cannot argue with theologically. Because some people, I, they know much more theologically than I know. And I remember when I first became a believer, people would try to stump me with questions. And I remember I had an Apostle Paul in my life, and he said, Bill, when you don't know, give them two things. I said, what's that? He said, number one, tell them that you don't know, but you'll be happy to look it up. (laughs) And the second thing is, give them your testimony. Because that's something nobody can ever take away from you, is what Jesus Christ did for you in your life. I don't know. I know what I, (laughs) I know what I used to be like, and I know that I'm not that way now in my life, and it was through Jesus, the reason I'm not that way. It's when I quit drinking, when I quit smoking, and when I quit drugging, I didn't go to AA, I didn't go to these other meetings, I went directly to the Word of God. And the Word of God is what delivered me from all those things in my life I needed to get away. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. My wife may think so, but... (laughs) Jennifer. (laughs) That That was a joke. My wife's name is Judah. And one day I slipped and said something else, and they won't let me live it down. But anyway, she's in the other room right now. But, but the whole point that I'm trying to get across is people would constantly say, and you'll hear this every day, the world is falling apart. No, it's not. The world's all coming together just the way the Scriptures read it. And when you and I don't know what to do, I'll tell you what the cure is for the world right now. I know what the cure is for the rebellious teenager. I know what the cure is for the drug addict. I know what the cure is for the woman beater. I know what the cure is for everything in life that could ail us, and that is Jesus. That's the cure for every one of us. That's why today I want us to go through and see who Jesus is. Jesus is God. And if you don't believe that Jesus is God, you won't go to him for deliverance. You won't go to Jesus to have a miracle performed in your life. You won't go to Jesus and say, Lord, I need your help to pull through this situation. Because if you don't believe that he is the Lord of your life, you don't believe that he is the Lord of your life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, for this book of John. We thank you, Lord, for the author. We thank you, Lord, that that as we come in and we open your word, Lord, that we can just open it up and dig in. And, Lord, that you reveal yourself to each one of us. Lord, I know that every time we open up your scriptures, Lord, I want every one of us in here to be able to, when we open up your word, It's just like you opening up your mouth and speaking to each one of us. Lord, you are the Word. We thank you, Father, for everything that we've talked about this morning. And Lord, for those other religions, Father, we're not here to condemn them. I'm here to speak truth to your church here. So be it from there. 
And I pray, Father, that as the door opens, that we would be able to minister to people that do not know you as the God. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Next week.